That was amazing. That was brilliant. Oh my gosh, I want to go to Antarctica. Do you want to go to Antarctica? I'd have to get a, a proper coat for the uh, adequate oh, uh, warmth no. in Antarctica because it's a bit cold there, but brilliant film. Absolutely really, really brilliant. So inspiring. And it's people like Anthony that have really inspired me in life. So guys, that's the end of our support and well-being hour. Now we've got a new theme and it's STEM, which, you know, as a young marine scientist, I'm an example of somebody that works in STEM. And basically STEM is all around us. It's science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And what I love about it is that it feeds into so many elements of society and it can really be such a force for good. So as a marine scientist who has studied a lot of things like threats in our oceans, I just, yeah, it's just such an amazing thing to be involved in. You know, every day I've gone to work over the last five years and felt like I'm having a positive impact in the world. And I think that there are some really fantastic vocations in it. And I actually had a brilliant chat with somebody who we're going to go on to in a minute from uh, one of the interviews that I had. But first of all, we just want to touch on a couple of things that we didn't cover in the last session. So some useful resources to help you with support and well-being. So we've, got, we've talked about Childline, Childline yep. and then we've also got Young Minds. So this is another organisation as well that you can ring if you ever need any support or help. So the number to call or to text them is 85258. And then there's also the Samaritans. So the Samaritans actually took my dad in when he was younger and helped his family, my family, through a difficult time. They're another great organisation that you can get in touch with. And the number to call or to text with them is 116123. And we've spoken about well-being. Well-being, looking after your well-being, can be as simple as just getting up and going for a walk. Absolutely. You know, what do you do to keep yourself happy? Train. Oh. Run in the park. Oh. Watch WWE. That's what I like. <laughs> People always laugh at me because they say, oh, do you into football, basketball? Nope, straight wrestling. That's me through and through. And the straight Undertaker wrestling. retired on Sunday, which is very sad. 30 years in the business, ladies and gentlemen, and the dead man is no more. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Pass me a tissue. <laughs> So look, we've got all different ways that we look after ourselves. But anyway, back to this session's theme, STEM. So next up is going to be a really great chat that I had with somebody who works in the IT industry. Now, this couldn't be further from <laughs> my industry. So it was really insightful for me to learn what it's like and the attributes that you need as an individual going into it. So we're going to go over there. If you're interested in IT, this is definitely the session for you. Okay, welcome back everybody. We're going in with another interview session. And so anybody that might be interested in the IT sector, this is going to be really insightful for you because I'm joined by Hugh, who is a software developer for a really cool organization company called CGI. And we're going to be talking all about the things that you might be able to develop the skills that you might need to go into the sector, but mainly just talking to Hugh about his experience of working in this industry. So hi Hugh, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you? Hello Shai, thank you very much. I'm very well and how are you? I'm good. We're all working from home at the moment. It's a strange world, but um, yeah. I just want to first of all go in and ask you, so what is your role with CGI? Um, and what does, what does a day in your life look like at work? Uh, well, I'm a software developer at CGI and I, I suppose I've been with the company for around about a year. Um, having said that, you know, I've, I've something like 30 years experience in the IT industry wow. and largely the roles I've had have all been um, in software development, a little bit of testing mm -hmm. and some software support as well. <clears throat> um, but uh, I mean, I, I like working at CGI mainly because um, I think of the, the, the variety of projects that I get to work on mm -hmm. um, and the technology that, that's, that's involved. As well, plus the people are um, are all very pleasant and, and nice, and you know there's a good team spirit. So yeah, yeah, I, I enjoy it. And it's, it's a good place to work. 
That's um, always nice. It's nice when you have a good team and people that you get along with, and it's lovely to hear that you have such a positive environment there. Oh yes, I mean I should say that you know I've I've, I've had these experiences in all in well not not necessarily all but certainly most of the roles I've I've worked in. Mm. By and large, people are, uh, are all very pleasant wherever you go. So that's brilliant. And so, what do what projects does CGI work on? Well, we, we work a, on a whole variety of projects across a whole um, range of different business sectors. Mm. You know, ranging from sort of government to defence to finance um, to insurance, um, sort of space. So um, you know, the, the, you know, it's a, it's a huge company with something yeah. like eighty thousand employees and. You know, in, in I suppose virtually every country in the world. Yeah. Uh, so we, you know, we have a, um, a we, we know we cover a, a, all all of the business sectors, and we you know we yeah. have people with a, a lot of experience. It's a lot of variety. It sounds like the job's quite interesting. Then, are you do projects last quite a long time, or are they usually quite quick moving? Uh, I suppose they can vary. Um, I've I've worked on uh, three projects and that's just in the space of it in the space of a year mm. um, some of them have only lasted for example a couple of months but the one I, I work on now you know I've been doing it for about the last sort of four or five six months and um, okay, it'll, it'll, it'll go on for, for another six months yeah um, <laughs> but we, we tend to um, we tend to we, we form a project team to 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 work on a particular project once we once we've won the won the bid okay. uh, and and then what you know we, we take it from inception through to programming, coding, testing, and delivery to, to the customer at the end. And, uh, and once all that's done, we, you know, we become free to go and, and work on another project, perhaps using different technology, mm. um, you know, perhaps a, a different, um, different sort of business sector. Mm. Um, so. And so you've worked in the industry, you said for 30 years, so you've seen it change quite a lot over time I imagine you know if I think of all the advancements that we've had in top technology and software in even just the last 10 years it's been a huge change so what attributes and skills do you think are important for you know youngsters that are looking to come into this sector for them for them to have in this modern day and age uh, to work in the um, in the IT industry in general I would say you primarily you need to have a very inquiring mind and you have to enjoy solving problems and not get too frustrated by being stuck on the same issue for a long period of time. Yeah. I mean, for example, there, there are always people to help you. Um, you know, you've got to remember that. And there will always be people who are more experienced than you. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things I have found is that you do have to be prepared to sort of reinvent yourself periodically okay. I found that working in, in this industry you you know you have um, a variety of career paths that you can take mm. I mean most people sort of start off at some sort of um, in, in, a, in a role like a programmer or perhaps some sort of anal analyst or support role mm. and and they and they sort of work, work their way up to become more technical and then go through management and on to sort of leadership and, and you know maybe further yeah um, for myself I've always stayed in, in a technical capacity Okay. And I've found that the industry has allowed me to to carry on really doing what I enjoy. Mm. And that's that's very much the case at, at um, CGI. You know, we, we have a um, um, a career path for people who want to stay in, in a in a technical capacity. And you know, you can start right at the bottom and and work your way up mm. through a variety of um of sort of levels and become more and more experienced as you go. You know, as time passes. <clears throat> So there seems to be quite a good structure for career progression, so to speak, to support you, you know, throughout your career as you go on, which, which is great. Um, so you've spoken a bit about, you know, the attributes of having sort of like a naturally inquisitive and creative mind and being somebody that, you know, can problem solve. How can students develop those skills before they, you know, come to an organisation like CGI and try to get a job, for example? I think it's probably important for anyone to play to their strengths. Mm. So you will know whether you're interested in technology and whether you're interested in, in problem solving. And if you are, then, you know, a technology career could well be the one for you. Yeah. Um, probably what you would need to do is just to try and get some practical experience of, of developing software and you know you, you can go onto the internet and download various software tools on, onto your computer and and just start playing around um writing small oh, really? programs 
That's oh, yeah. I didn't know that. Didn't know that. Yeah, there's a whole variety of software out there. I mean, there's more software out there than I would be capable of <laughs> mentioning in the space of a day. <laughs> wow. So, um, there's, there's, always, there's always something new to, to download. And there's always plenty of help available on the, um, on, on the web, um, on websites such as Stack Overflow and um, GitHub and all sorts of places like that where you can go for software, go for help. And um, yeah, so there's plenty to yeah. do. But you, you yeah. need to get that, that sort of, a little bit of programming experience under your belt, get a little bit of muscle memory built into your fingers, and and uh, just just write some software. You know, just just start with writing a simple program that says hello, and then work your way from there. Really, that's really good advice, and that's great that there are so many resources online that you know students or youngsters can get access to to sort of flex those skills and start building them. Um, so, I guess do you have to go to university to follow a career in this sector. Is it is it looked upon as like a, a statutory requirement, or can you just go straight from A levels? I wouldn't really be able to answer that entirely accurately. I've known people who have uh, just bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, mm. doctorates. I've known people without degrees working in the industry, mm. and uh, really, the the one thing that stands out amongst the, the very good programmers are the people who have an inc well, basically an inquisitive mind, mm. problem solving. Yeah. And, um, certainly, if you do go to university, there are plenty of openings for you, and probably more so than had you not. But that's not to say that if you don't go to university, you know, you can't still find your way into a, a career in technology. I, but I, I'm just saying that I think it's probably more difficult like okay. that. Yeah. Will, notice of you if you have a good degree, if yeah. you have a higher degree, and if you have this this um, crucial experience under your belt. Yeah. One of the best programmers I, I work with at the moment, you know, does not have a have a degree. Yeah. Um, but he was able to gain his experience by writing his own web application and yeah. showing it to to an employer when he went along for an interview. And oh, he impressed wow. them so much. They they took him on, and now he works at, at CGI. You know, whereas I have a degree in chemistry and I'm, I'm now working in the <laughs> IT. So um, That's you know, there's, 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 a, there's a whole variety of routes in. Yeah. And I suppose I think this is something that a real sort of recurring theme I'm getting from all of the people that I've been speaking to is this having, you know, experience. It's one thing having a degree, but that really has become quite statutory now, although you've, you know, as you said, it does have weighting because a degree obviously is higher education but at the same time having you know work experience or having had the tenacity to go out there and create something yourself to show an employer and be like look look what I can do is actually yes. you know very a very clever thing and something that I think students should be thinking about like how can they showcase their skills and also their passion for a subject so hmm. big question that's been asked to everybody is how is COVID impacting the IT sector? Has it impacted you at CGI? Uh, it's impacted me at CGI, but in a positive way. Hmm. Okay. Um, wow. Okay. I, that's uh, probably the first positive I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I really enjoy working from home, actually. Okay. And um, yeah. I have to say that I also enjoyed working in the office. Mm. So uh, I'm, I'm sort of happy with both. And they, they both have their sort of pros and cons, really. Mm -hmm. um, the advantages of working in the office is that, you know, you're with everyone else and there's a little bit of um, um, banter going on and yeah. you form friendships and, you know, you get quite close to everyone. Mm. Um, whereas working at home is very convenient, you know. So yeah. um, all I have to do is come downstairs in the morning and I'm in my <laughs> office. And I'm still late for the half past nine meeting every day. <laughs> Even when I don't have to travel sort of 20 or 30 miles to work, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Still, I mean, that, that shows whose fault it is, really. Yeah. Um, but, but um, yes, I know this COVID is, a, you know, really a, a terrible thing. And, and once we're at the back of it, mm. the better. Um, but I think what it has shown primarily is that um, there are many industries that are capable of, of working through COVID. Mm. And particularly in the in the technology sector you know where all you need is a phone line and a computer yeah. and you know you can you can get back to work you, know, you don't actually have to be in the office mm. so um, it's quite a safe profession i suppose in okay, in, that's interesting. Know, in in that way you know you you, you can you can work and tech, and people who are involved in technology are, are typically quite uh, quite adaptable mm. you know so we you know we kind of we adapt to this way of working and 
we use, things like Microsoft Teams, and we're always in contact with each other anyway. So in many ways, it's, it's actually not a lot different from the office. It, yeah. Because you, you're always interacting with people. And um, so I, I, I mean, I don't think it took us too long to adapt. No. You know, and um, so to the extent now where I feel that, um, you know, I'm just as productive now, not in the office as I was yeah. in the office. And saving so, on, um, on emissions, going to work by <laughs> just wandering oh, down yes, to yes. the home office. I mean, there are so many benefits of, um, yeah. of, of working from home, just from an environmental point of view as yeah. well. You know, Definitely. You know, it's like um, having a huge pay rise, you know, <laughs> every <yeah>. month. <laughs> Yeah, because unfortunately, there's a lot of people that spend a lot of money on, 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 you know, commuting to work. I know, for example, my auntie, she works in London and she was spending thousands of pounds on commuting on a train every every day into work. And now she doesn't have that. So, yeah, that is definitely a benefit and great to hear as well that, you know, your company, CGI, has adapted to it, as you seem all very naturally capable of doing um, and that it hasn't yeah, it hasn't had a huge impact on you. My yes, I mean, certainly there are some people who who have really been yeah. very badly impacted by you mm. know, the COVID pandemic. And uh, but, but thankfully, you know, we are, I suppose, the lucky ones in the technology mm. sector. So a, a, maybe a, um, I'm not asking you to disclose how much you earn each month, but we had a question from one of the students about, you know, what sort of what's the starting pay for a cyber security analyst? This might be a very specific role that you might not specifically know the sort of pay grades for but you know what what is it is it a well-paying industry i would say yes it is a well-paying industry mm. um, i'm certainly not unhappy with what i'm paid i'm i'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm more than happy and um, particularly you know as as um <clears throat> it allows you to, uh, to stay to stay doing what I'm good at, you know, in a in a technology function, I don't have to climb the um, climb the ladder to yeah. higher management in order to get more pay. So mm. I, I can um, I can get a reasonable level of pay and, and still stay technical as, as, as to what the sort of the starting yeah. salaries are for graduates, you know, in the technology industry or the cyber industry. I, I would estimate it's somewhere around the late twenties to early thirties, depending on yeah. you know which company it was and. Uh, mm. And sort of what what the role is and what you can sort of negotiate for yourself, mm. really. Mm. Um, but I, I wouldn't be able to be any more specific than that. No, I think that's a brilliant <laughs> answer, and it's lovely to hear that it isn't a case of that you have to climb, you know, the sort of you know to managerial levels necessarily to actually earn good money. It's lovely to hear that you can still earn a good living doing what you love, and I think that's what a lot of people strive to do is to do something that they love, you know speaking to the to the students at you know Bristol Met they want to have an impact they want to you know they don't necessarily want to go you know running after money and I think it's just really nice to hear that there are professions out there where people can do what they love and still be paid well for it. Yes ultimately to be successful in whatever career you choose you have to enjoy it. Yes. You, know, you, you have yeah. to sort of you have to believe in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, for example, there'd, there'd be no point in me trying to become a, a team leader or a project manager or or something like that because I wouldn't enjoy it. Yes. So I'm happy what I'm doing. So yeah. this is why I'm successful in, in what I do because yeah. I'm happy doing it. Yeah. And so that leads me so well on to my last question for you is what do you enjoy most about your job? <laughs> Golly. Um, <laughs> Sorry, maybe I a big question. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I th I, it's a mixture really. Um, I think it's a mixture of the technical challenge mm -hmm. um, that I do like that um, and the idea of building something I mean not necessarily with bricks and mortar but in the idea of cr constructing an application or a system that's going to make other people's lives easier or it's going to save them money or it's going to save them time or it might save someone's life you know so I, and I enjoy the aspects of, of problem solving as well mm -hmm. of taking a, a challenge, a difficult problem, and eventually getting to the end of it and saying, look, I've, I've done this, this is what I've built. Yeah. Um, so that's that's really important to me. I mean, the other thing I enjoy are, are the people I work with. Mm. And um, it's, 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 it's great to have sort of a, um, like a, a healthy atmosphere yeah. in the office where we sort of, you know, we, we have a joke and we, we make a bit of fun of each other and um, we don't take <laughs> things too, too yeah. seriously. Yeah. You know, you've, you've obviously got to sort of uh, keep your comment, comments appropriate to whoever's around you. <laughs> but, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's nice to have um, conversations, a bit of banter, 
you know to go out with your work colleagues occasionally after work yeah um, you know in in some cases people i've worked with have become lifelong friends so um that's so nice that's what i like that's one of the things that's that's something that's very important to me about work actually and that's just getting on with with the people i i work with yeah um not being afraid to to speak the truth to speak your mind to be open and really just be honest with other people and if you go if you ask people for help and you're kind to them I th it's it's reciprocated and it just it's just condu conducive to a healthy working atmosphere absolutely no i think that's i completely echo everything you say having nice people or having people around you that get along with that are supportive that are kind it just makes it just makes every day just so much better and it's just so nice to hear that you have that um you know at cgi it, so it sounds like a brilliant place to work and it's been oh, yes. really mm. really great to speak to you really insightful especially as this is an industry that is very far away from my own and i really think that students watching this will get so much out of it so thank you so much for joining me today um and enjoy the rest of your evening all right thank you very much thank you bye bye thank you Hi, I'm Hannah. I'm a student recruitment officer at KPMG. Um, on Wednesday, I am going to be running a session on personal brand. In this session, you can expect to find out a number of things, including helping you to understand what a brand really is and what it represents, and beginning to really kind of see those differences between a corporate brand and your own personal brand, and also just starting to learn how important your own personal brand can be. As well as this, I'll also be providing lots more information about KPMG and what we do. And if you do have any questions for me on the day, I'll be happy to help out. And I hope to see you there. Right, well, I hope all you budding IT specialists out there really enjoyed that chat with you. It was so insightful for me. Yeah. Juna, you work in IT anyway, I do. so do you enjoy it? Is, it? is it good? I'm still developing my skills and my networking <laughs> skills, etc., within the IT uh, framework. Um, it's really good, it's lots to learn, um, but you have to be a quick thinker in IT. You yeah. absolutely have to be a quick thinker and really passionate about programming and coding. Yeah. That's one thing that's very, very evident in IT, yes. Yeah, and that's exactly what I touched on in my conversation with Hugh, you know, he was telling about being, you know, saying, you've got to be creative, good at problem solving. And, you know, these are all aspects of what we really want you guys to get out of today. These are things that you can go away and nurture yourself. And as you're going to find out, in my next interview that I had with a wonderful and inspiring woman called Kate Taylor, who is a leadership coach, there are lots of things that you can do in your life to develop these skills. So we spoke specifically about resilience. So we're going to go over to my chat now with Kate. Hi everyone, so we have a slightly different session for you now, where instead of talking to a prospective employer, we're speaking to an inspiring individual. So Kate, who is joining me for this session, is a leadership trainer and coach. And we're gonna be talking all about emotional and physical resilience in this session. So I think you'll be getting a lot of really good practical advice out of this. So hi Kate, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yes, I'm good. You're looking really lovely and colourful. I love the I love the top. It's a brilliant colour. <sighs> My interview outfit. <laughs> Today, <laughs> I, a bright hoodie. A bright hoodie is great. Uh, so, yeah. Where are you at the moment? Uh, very well. Yes, I'm uh, looking at blue sky outside. Actually, I hear it's not so bright where you are, but um, mm. I'm. Socially distancing in Portugal at the moment, and it yeah. is sunny today. <laughs> well, if you can, please send some of the sunshine over to us because we're not having a great spell at the moment. It seems to be raining every day. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kay, I thought Honestly. it would be great to start by just asking you, you know, can you tell us a bit about 
your background, so you know, you're a leadership trainer and coach. Um, how did you become a, a coach like this? And, and you know, what's your story? I, I think I became a coach very gradually in stages. I had no grand plan for life. Um, I was a bit of a lost soul, actually. I, you know, the school didn't excel. Um, quite a troubled background. Um, came out of care, actually, and was uh, uh, adopted. Okay. Uh, no plan in life. No, no concept that actually I could have a plan, even. And luckily, I went climbing one day. <laughs> I met some really nice people and um, enjoyed their company and fell, literally fell, well, not fell off the climb, but fell into uh, leading, <laughs> as I thought I should reassure you that, leading um, climbing groups. I met this uh, nice group of people. I did lots of work with schools, but I also worked for a, a charity special sport. And it, it just, I really enjoyed helping people do things that they didn't think they could do. They were, they were people who all needed extra care for various reasons really enjoyed it so that that became my my life really at that point was was basically climbing and through that work i gradually got more skills and um, so you know in fact i learned to navigate because i kept getting lost on the way to interesting places to climb <laughs> there were That's lots of small amazing. cracks in Sussex where i was and i got lost that many times i thought i'd learn to navigate um, <laughs> and actually really enjoyed teaching others then to navigate because it's very empowering every time you learn something i think your self-belief grows um and over the years it's it's kind of grown from there actually i am now an endurance sport coach mm -hmm. i um gosh yeah i i met this lovely man ian who i've now married uh, who has been involved in triathlon for years and um he watched me trying to swim one day and we established that I couldn't actually swim I should say I was 48 at that point I could just about float but I couldn't swim yeah. so there's something weird within me that says if I can't do something I'll perhaps I'll set myself a challenge of learning to do it so I bought myself a wetsuit put myself into a triathlon and uh, then spent the next few months learning to swim so that I could do because I could see that it was actually quite an exciting sport yeah um and that's kind of evolved now. Uh, I really, really enjoy working with people, either people who are established athletes, but also people who, like me, had one of those things that was completely alien to them. I should say triathlon, for those who don't know, is swim, bike, run. Uh, my strategy for the, the first triathlon, actually I should say the second, because the first triathlon, after spending six months learning to swim, uh, the night before the event, there was a big storm and the swim element got cancelled. Oh, no. <laughs> I was unlucky. Uh, so the second one, the, the strategy was basically don't drown, don't fall off the bike and don't stop running. Um, and I think... <laughs> Great strategy. <laughs> it, that for me sums up life and resilience really, is just don't stop doing, yeah, going in the direction that you're trying to go in. Yeah, and these these things that you're doing are quite extreme things. These are, you know, triathlon is quite an extreme sport, I would say, maybe, you know, it's it takes a lot of endurance, you know, physical strength and resilience. And these are all core aspects of kind of what you do through your coaching. You teach people to be, you know, more emotionally resilient and also to build physical resilience. So what what does you know uh, emotional resilience look like what what is an emotionally resilient person yeah if you look up the definition of um made some notes yesterday so the definition of resilience is either the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties so toughness mm. which is good um but also the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape and elasticity mm. and i kind of like that one actually um, because I think resilience is that thing I just said that I use during during an event of just not stopping, <laughs> just whatever you're doing. There's something we call of just working at best pace in the moment. Mm. So sometimes in life you you're firing and and you can do things really well and really strongly, and other times life for whatever reason is really hard, and you just best pace in the moment. You know, and if that means 
you need some extra sleep, some recovery time. You're going to go through the day more slowly, but you're still going in the direction that you're intending. So I, I think, and when I say direction, which I'm just going to add, add some detail to that, because direction isn't just, you know, I've made my list of things to do and I'm going to do it no matter what, because that's not direction for me. Direction is that real purpose in life, the, the overall direction that you're going in. So that might mean that one day you take a little walk around the garden first and, yeah. and then continue. And it's not being rigid. It's, it's kind of going with the flow, but knowing where that flow is, mm. is going. So finding that purpose and knowing what your goal is. Yeah. And, and just continually moving at best pace. Yeah. And so what would you think are the key things that are necessary for building emotional resilience to for whatever i suppose because you know emotional resilience is, a resilience is something that can be applied to every aspect of life to whether you're doing a sport to whether you're you know just trying to go to work every day and or or you know just getting over emotional things that happen in our lives so what are the key things that sort of or the recipe that goes into building good strong emotional resilience Gosh, I think um, it's complex, and one of my answers to ask when they ask me a question, it depends. Yes. <laughs> so, so it does just depend on whether we're talking about daily life resilience or big event resilience. So I think on a day-to-day -day basis, there's aspects of actually getting to know your strengths and weaknesses. Mm. So I know there's been bits of my life when... Um, just on a day-to-day -day basis, I've either tried to do too much or I've tried to do things that are really not me. I've tried to n not ever ask for help. Um, I've done some things you know, badly along the way that I've learned from. And, and so day-to-day -day resilience is kind of missing life, you know, making life easier, asking someone for help. Um, if you're not a morning person, do the most demanding things you know, either mentally or physically demanding in the afternoon mm. or the evening when your strength is. Or if you're somebody who wakes up at five and you feel really intelligent at that point and you've got some intellectual tasks to do, do them then. You know, yeah. it's about um, kind of making life work as ease, easily, or I nearly said easily. I do make up words sometimes. No, <laughs> I do that. I do that. I make up sayings. Actually. <coughs> I like to make up sayings. <laughs> So some aspects of resilience, emotional resilience, physical resilience, are so kind of thinking ahead, planning ahead, and managing yourself and your tasks. So actually, you're kind of preempting the need for resilience, so you don't need it quite so much because you haven't created that huge problem in the first place. Mm. Um, the opposite end of the spectrum, perhaps, from day-to-day -day resilience is that kind of big event resilience something huge happens you lose your job you lose a family member you know there are big things that happen that that actually um you you can't expect i think to just keep going in exactly the same way and it's okay to go wow this really hurts and i'm just going to be nice to myself and you know adapt life however temporarily to adjust even if because it, it might be something that is going to be an ongoing situation yeah. And you might need to totally readjust life and replan. Um, taking some time out and feeling what the new, the new, oh, the new normal, I had to say it. Is. Yeah, and, it's here. You know, maybe we're having one of those moments right now. Life is not what it was. Yeah. Um, and taking time out to adjust to it yeah, is, no. is another form. I think, I think that's a beautiful yeah and that that leads on so nicely I think to talking about the new norm as you say you know right now we're living in unprecedented times facing a global pandemic which for so many young people is probably a really daunting thing you're just about to leave school and you're meant to be going off into the world and sort of you know spreading your wings but wow there's this massive roadblock in the way and so you know, what are the things, I, I, from what you're saying, it sounds like physical and emotion resilience, like physical and emotional resilience have a lot to play, they have a lot, they're very connected. And so, you know, I, what, sorry, carry on. 
Uh, no, I've, I, I think so. I, I totally yeah. agree. I think that's yeah. in, in And actually one of the most essential things, I think, is to work on the basics of, you know, health and fitness. I, I do with, um, with my triathletes. I get them to do every start of every season a robustness assessment. Uh, it's a mild form of torture, really, but you get them to do lots of physical things. So don't quote me on that. <laughs> physical things to assess how strong they are. They might think they're strong at swim, bike, run, but actually there are physical elements which make life easier or not. And I think doing that in your own life is a really important thing. So basic fitness, you know, we all know what it is, but I wonder how many of us uh, do it. You know, do you get enough sleep? You know, if you haven't slept, the smallest problem is going to be a big problem. But how do you deal with managing stress, managing anxiety in a huge situation? And so, yeah, the basic things of sleep. Now, if, if sleep is an issue for you, go back a stage. Why is it an issue? Are you on your social media till midnight each night and you know blue light in your face till late at night? Um, are you drinking lots of coffee throughout the evening? You know, take, take each stage back. Um, to sleep is, I believe, it sounds strange coming from uh, someone who you know, trains people to the swim, bike, run for 10 hours or so. <laughs> but actually, sleep is the most important thing in life cannot do without it you can't function optimally without it um basic fitness you know we all know the five times 30 thing so putting triathletes to one side just you know, normal people um yeah the very basic of fitness is said to be five lots of cardio each week um strength training eating well, you know, your five to 10 portions of fruit and veg each day, you know, put those basics in place for two reasons. One is that you enhance health. And if you're healthy and strong, you have this sense of being able to function, being able to do things well. Yeah. Uh, but there's also, I think, an emotional layer to that of you're looking after yourself. Mm. You know, we all know when we're not looking after ourselves, don't we? And we, we kind of keep that to ourselves. And and it's that sort of little secret you have that that actually you're not not all that you could be and you're not doing the right things. And I think if you actually get rid of that and are doing the right things, you you flourish. You you not only function better, but you think better about yourself. It's that yeah. um I think it was Stephen Covey who talked about a trust bank. And every time you do something positive, it goes in your own personal trust bank can you well, start to feel that. better about yourself and it, and some of those things are really small things you know I, I like eating so for me eating five to ten portions of fruit and veg day yeah I can do that yeah and when you know that you're doing it that's you know that's your first brick in your or your first deposit in the the trust bank of looking after you yeah um, things like spending time outdoors I know you know different lockdowns in different places but actually we are allowed, you know, wherever you are at right now, you are allowed to time, spend some time outdoors. Uh, and it gives you a different perspective on life, I think. Mm. So, yeah, vitamin D, of course, is very important. So if you have any sunlight, so I'm not <gasps> feeling guilty. Be in case you haven't. <laughs> oh, Actually, vitamin D is worth it all on its own. It's, it's worth supplementing if there isn't the sunlight you need. Um, but just spending time outdoors, it's it's that getting away from yeah. getting away from oh, that feeling of being overwhelmed by whatever is going on in your life. And just yeah. I, I, some of these things are not things that you're doing because you feel like doing them because you're feeling so great. They're things that you need to do despite not feeling great because they're steps in the direction of feeling better. Yeah. And, and I think that applies to the little things in life and the big things in life. Yeah. Just no. keep can, taking the right steps. I completely agree with you. I think so. I, you know, I grew up at a stage where my childhood was very much screen free. And then, 
you know, I got to my early teens and that's really when Scream started to become such a big thing. And I think unfortunately now we do live in a world where we're constantly sort of, you know, glued to screens. And I think that it's a really important message for young people that it's so important to get to go outside. Something as simple as you say, as going outside can make a huge difference to your productivity, to your mood and to your success ultimately um, because it will make you your 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 like you say investing in that trust bank you're investing in yourself yeah totally it, it also allows for something different to happen other than what you've put in the day I saw a red squirrel a few weeks ago wow <laughs> what a moment I was trail running and it ran across in front of me that's so great <laughs> That wouldn't have happened, you know, sat no. in front of me for It wouldn't. And so there might be some young people that, you know, are really inspired by you. You know, you you were doing something that's I, I I'm gonna say not a conventional, it's not a conventional route. You know, you're not you're working for yourself and working for other people and helping other people. And so you kind of are your your own boss in a way, which might be quite inspiring to young people because that's a different way to go. You know, there's one thing working for an employer, but there's one thing being your own boss. And so um anyone that any young people that are interested in you know doing what you do, becoming you know a leader or a coach, what advice would you give because it takes a very specific skill set that isn't taught in school right so how can how can students do what you do i think there's a few key things uh, and obviously the first thing is training in whatever you want to do because mm. if you don't know what you're talking about you won't do it very well <laughs> true and so obviously you know being being trained in whatever it is and i have to say i followed my passions throughout life I suppose because I didn't have a plan and um, I must say the early years I was a bit like I was on a pinball machine and I just sort of bounced from one thing to another and there was no plan and there might have been elements of luck in there and um, but maybe there weren't I, I have a theory about luck I, I call it the meeting of opportunity with preparation I love that so, so maybe I just happened to be in the right place but I'd already prepared by you know, being the person I was or, or looking for an opportunity and being willing to take it. So I've met some inspiring people. And I think if you meet an inspiring person and they do something that resonates with you, it's really worth thinking about what it is they do. And, and I'm not sure that I do anything like anyone I've ever met. There's elements of it, but I'm, to, I'm just me. Um, but I can identify some people along the way that did some things that I thought, yeah, I like that. Uh, and I've, I've either looked at what it is about what they're doing that I like, or kind of use that as a, oh, I'll go in that direction a little and see what, what it teaches me. Mm -hmm. So some of the qualifications I've got along the way, which have been really, really useful, have been, I mean, obviously things like climbing, navigation, a hill more than leader mountain leader yeah they're, they're all really useful things but actually what underpins them all is the soft skills the communication skills mm. and actually one of the most useful things that i inadvertently did in my life um inadvertently that sounds like it. i just woke up one morning and accidentally did it uh, but i did a counseling skills course just i i'd had some counseling early on in life um and it had been very useful for me. And I'd, I met someone actually who was a yoga teacher, um, but had done the counseling skills course and it inspired me to, to do that too. And the type of counseling course I did was um, person-centered counseling. And it's all about building a relationship with someone by building trust. So unconditional positive regard, um, empathy and congruence. So they're all things congruence is about basically who you are being very clear to people by how you behave uh, and that's really important and um, unconditional positive regard regard is is kind of what it says on the tin really that you look upon every person as they're okay there might be aspects of what they do that could be better or less annoying or you know or perhaps are a barrier for them at this moment but underneath we are all just really okay humans 
just kind of doing the best we can really with what we know at that moment yeah. and an empathy of course is the ability to to be in somebody else's shoes or imagine you're in their shoes and understand them and understand their motivations I think if you're applying all that to yourself as well as to others because I think one of the first barriers I had to overcome was actually thinking I had any worthwhile characteristics at all and mm. um, and and once I actually I'm I'm okay. I do the you know, I do what I'm passionate about. I there's some stuff I like doing, there's some I like helping others, um, I like getting to know people. So I kind of followed my heart in terms of how I use that. Um, but there were some key bits of training and qualification that helped me to shape it along the way. Yeah. So even though there's lots of perhaps different activities which have evolved, the underlying bit is is the same it's i'm just helping helping people to achieve their goals whatever that goal is and it might be in a leadership capacity it might be um you know finishing a triathlon sometimes actually the bit before that of just doing the training because that is a really hard thing for people yeah. um, but it equally you know i raised my son on a bit of a <laughs> women a theory really um which was <laughs> Using those counselling skills of, you know, uh, thinking he was a good person. Yeah. Um, love and firm boundaries was my kind of thinking with him. I'd, yeah. I'd always, always show him love and respect and, and teach him what the boundaries are, but let him also explore whatever he wanted to do in, in life. And the, the only rule really was, you know, follow your passions and yeah do what you enjoy and I think actually it can be difficult to follow your passions because perhaps other people have ideas of what you should do yeah. that aren't quite yours maybe you have to get to know yourself what are you passionate about and it might be really weird it, it might be that yeah I'm a marine biology how did how did you get interested in that yeah. Yeah. where did that come from <laughs> yeah and, you know Getting to know yourself and allowing yourself to explore what, what you'd really like to do and encourage the courage to do it. Yeah, I think um, that's such a good point. Having almost emotional resilience to, you know, your nearest and dearest having an opinion of what you should be doing or how you should live life. So society is full of that. And I think that's why you're so inspiring, Kate, is that, you know, you've almost gone, well, you know, this is what I'm passionate about. I'm going to explore it. And it can be really difficult to stay strong with that when people around you are going, um, like, well, when are you going to go and get a real job? Because that's something I experienced with my grandparents. I could never understand what the job of a marine biologist was. They didn't think it was a real job. I've spent seven years at university gaining degrees. I have, you know, so much knowledge and understanding in this scientific area, but I was met with a lot of, well, when are you going to get a real job? Like, what, what are you doing? And that can be really hard to, to weather that, you know, when you're like, but I love what I do and I know that this is my path and, and trying to, to keep going, it can be difficult. Yeah, I, 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 think, um, I think I said this to you before the interview, actually, also life is long, hopefully. Um, yeah. And you don't have to have all the answers at any one time and I think if you just take the next step you know you've got your general direction you think you're going in right now but daring to take that next step whatever it may be mm. and, and letting life evolve and that's that thing of um, you know one of the forms of resilience is is that elasticity mm. is also you could call that flexibility or evolution or you know you're just taking a new form i mean i've said i'm out here in portugal at the moment well i'm out in portugal at the moment doing lots of online work mm. because my entire season of leading groups doing various activities got cancelled back in march and i thought oh well I'll, I'll go out to portugal for a few months and you know spend some time out there and, and rethink you know you have to so i suppose that's a form of resilience that you're you're not saying oh i'm broken you know i was supposed to do xyz that's that's off the cards now it's continually okay so what what do i need to change now yeah. 
in order to survive. Yeah. Can or I ask? Survive, right? Yeah. <laughs> to, to, yeah. It's not life or death, but um, <laughs> or we hope. <laughs> I want to ask you one last question, Kate. So, you know, if any young person watching this is inspired and they want to go and learn more about the topic of emotional and physical resilience and sort of start doing that work, where can where can they go to sort of you know learn? Gosh, there are lots of uh, resources out there. Actually, I'll, I sent you a mind map of some things I've been thinking yes. about, so I, I could upload that, I guess, to, to the Like To Be website. The like to be platform. Yep, platform. So that would give some ideas. Mm -hmm. um, there's also been, you know, there's a lot of stuff I've read. I, I like reading, I like learning. Um, there was a very good book I, I read uh, years and years ago. Goodness knows when it was published. Raj Basod wrote a book called Staying Sane. Um, and there was some, some stuff I put in my mind map actually about um, one of the really important things I think about resilience is having more than one aspect of yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you are a leadership trainer, or a mountain, let's, let's pick one bit of me, mountain leader. So back in March, I thought I was going to spend the, the, this season in mountains leading people doing exciting things it got cancelled if i was only a mountain leader i'd have been really crushed at that point but i'm also a triathlon coach i'm a wife i'm a mother i'm you know i'm i'm many other aspects of myself and that was something that when i read that book uh, the book is called staying sane and it's about positive mental health yeah and i think that's a different so it talks about all those actions that you need to take, some of which I've, I've said about just basically looking after yourself. Mm -hmm. So by having different aspects of how you view yourself, if one thing crumbles permanently or temporarily, you've still got all those other things that you are. We are not any of us just one thing yeah. that can be dissolved like that. You know. So try and um, find several things that, that you are that you do that that, have, that make you and um, the person you are which are positive things that that can't be changed by anyone else yeah and i think if you've got that sense of who you are then nothing else can quite disturb that it's, it's always fundamentally there yeah. uh, and certainly at the points in life that i've had major challenges or or you know sort of series of minor ongoing challenges that sense of who I am, what is fundamentally important to me. So even if someone does something dreadful, I'm still me. So they, they're them, they did that thing. I'm still me, I'll deal with it. I'll keep moving on in the direction and going. So I think some of that is, is important stuff. I think that's a brilliant way to finish. And I thank you so much for sharing all your thoughts and knowledge on this topic. It's been really inspiring to speak to you. So thank you so much for joining, Kate. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye.